views expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. This is the Cold Breakers. This is Paradox. I got T on the line in DC. Um, we are here again. Today is uh, January 31st, 27, 2017. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to go to a clip to get the show to kind of open the show up. It's about a two minute long clip. And so once we get that started, then we'll be ready to rock and roll uh, with the program. We do appreciate everybody jumping on, listening in. Appreciate it to the callers, obviously, as always. Uh, I'm glad we got D&T here again tonight to um, to get to get things going, I should say. And uh, we're going to be discussing a few different topics. Um, but one thing we'll be discussing is um, uh, the War Tribe. And we're going to try to discuss um, how white people as a collective group, um, you know, are really just, you know... It, it almost seems like they're designed just to just to go to war, and so um, um, you know we're gonna put some put try to put some context around just how the, you know just historically speaking and just kind of see uh, or try to get some some understanding of uh, what we're seeing as far as um, the level of violence that they've committed <clears throat> on this planet. Um, I think we're going to get ready and go to the clip. Uh, actually, Paradox, uh, greetings uh-huh. to you and greetings to the fellas. That clip is not coming up. When I click on the link, I knew it was uh-huh. something that uh, was going on. But when I click on to the link, YouTube says the video doesn't exist. So somebody could have deleted it since you last uh-huh. watched it. That quick, yeah, that's possible. Let me see, can I, uh, you're right, too. I just got to, um... Oh, you're right. I got an error myself. Let me see. Can I? Uh, you know what we can do? Let's try the. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to the. Give me one second here. Let's see. I should not pay for a clip. Let's do. Uh, you know what? Play, can you play that last clip? Fog of War. Yes, sir. Give me just a moment as I pull it up. For I appreciate you. that's that's about a seven minute clip, just so the audience know. Lemay was focused on only one thing: target destruction. Most Air Force generals could tell you how many planes they had, how many tons of bombs they dropped or whatever the hell it was, but he was the only person that I knew in the senior command of the Air Force who focused solely on the loss of his crews per unit of target destruction. I was on the island of Guam in his command in March of 1945. In that single night, we burned to death. 100,000 Japanese civilians in Tokyo, men, women, and children. Are you aware this was going to happen? Well, I was, I was 
part of a mechanism that, that in a sense recommended it. I analyze bombing operations and how to make them more efficient, i.e. Not more efficient in the sense of killing more, but more efficient in, in weakening the adversary. I wrote one report analyzing the efficiency of the B-29 operations. The B-29 could get above the fighter aircraft and above the air defense, so the loss rate would be much less. The problem was the accuracy was also much less. I don't want to suggest that it was my report that led to, I'll call it the firebombing. It isn't that I'm trying to absolve myself of blame for the firebombing. I don't want to suggest that it was I that put in LeMay's mind that his operations were totally inefficient and had to be drastically changed. But anyhow, that's what he did. He took the B-29s down to 5,000 feet and he decided to bomb with firebombs. Fifty square miles of Tokyo were burned. Tokyo was a wooden city, and when we dropped these fire bombs, and it just burned it. The choice of incendiary bombs, where did that come from? I think the, the, the issue is not so much incendiary bombs. I think the issue is, in order to win a war, should you kill 100,000 people in one night by firebombing or any other way? LeMay's answer would be clearly yes. McNamara, do you mean to say that instead of killing 100,000, burning to that 100,000 Japanese civilians, in that one night, we should have burned to death a lesser number or none, and then had our soldiers cross the beaches in Tokyo and been slaughtered in the tens of thousands? Is that what you're proposing? Is that moral? Is that wise? Why was it necessary to drop the nuclear bomb if LeMay was burning up Japan? And he went on from, from Tokyo to firebomb other cities. 58% of Yokohama. Yokohama is roughly the size of Cleveland. 58% of Cleveland destroyed. Tokyo is roughly the size of New York. 51% of New York destroyed. 99% of the equivalent of Chattanooga, which was Toyama. 40% of the equivalent of Los Angeles, which was Nagoya. This was all done before the dropping of the nuclear bomb, which, by the way, was dropped by LeMay's command. Proportionality should be a guideline in war. Killing 50 to 90 percent of the people of 67 Japanese cities and then bombing them with two nuclear bombs 
is not proportional in the minds of some people to the objectives we were trying to achieve. I don't fault Truman for dropping the nuclear bomb. The U.S.-Japanese war was one of the most brutal wars in all of human history. Kamikaze pilots, suicide, unbelievable. What one can criticize is that the human race prior to that time and today has not really grappled with what are, I'll call it the rules of war. Was there a rule then that said you shouldn't bomb, uh, shouldn't kill, shouldn't burn to death 100,000 civilians in a night? LeMay said, if we'd lost the war, we'd all have been prosecuted as war criminals. And I think he's right. He, and I'd say I, were behaving as war criminals. LeMay recognized that what he was doing would be thought immoral if his side had lost. But what makes it immoral if you lose and not immoral if you win? All right, all right. So we got to the end of the clip. Um, I think DC is on the uh, DC and T. Are you, are you, are you fellas uh, there? I know DC said he was dropping off, so I want to make sure he's there. He unmuted himself, but we don't hear him. I'm sorry. Can Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right, we can now. All right, good, 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 good. Greetings, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, wow. Powerful clip. Powerful clip. Um, T, are you there? Hey, he missed. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Yeah, yes, we're good. Yes, sir. Good so, 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 uh, Paradox, so how do you feel about the uh, Secretary of Defense? Um, Robert McNamara, and if anybody was want to kind of like just to give a little bit of background, um, that was the um, prior <coughs> Secretary of State during the conflict of uh, Vietnam War. Um, he was part of both the World War II experience. Um, pretty much, I'm pretty sure he was um, part of. Pr most likely a part of all the wars, all the conflicts during that time period between World War II when he was a young man still. He lived for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, relatively speaking, um, you know, when it comes down to the group that classified themselves as white, um, I think he died at 93 years of age. Um, he died um, fairly recently, 2009. Um, Robert Strange McNamara, that's, that's his name, his his full government name, um, as far as what's been disclosed, um, yes, the the middle name of this this um, self-proclaimed war criminal, um, outside of his his lips, um, he basically um, confirmed in himself, um, Robert Strange McNamara. Um, do you know? Do you know what, gener what very, generation very he is? Oh, he's in the greatest generation. Um, no, 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 no. Generation. Right, right, right. No, no. What? Gen <laughs> yeah, that's, I know, right. What um, well, and again, the reason why I'm asking you this is that I, this is just for the audience in general, just people that you interact with. You need to, I, I think, you should qualify people and try to kind of get an idea of of um, you know, just where they're where they're where they're from. And I think that that, that also assists in, in getting an understanding of how the mind works. So the reason why I was asking you that was, is he first? Is he first or second generation uh, white? Um, do you know? Second. Do you know if it's it? He's second oh, okay. generation. So his family came. His yeah, he's, he's 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 um, Irish descendant. Okay. 
And I think his mom was either Polish or let me just see, because pretty much uh, most of those people. So they came they came from the early 1900s. Time. Yeah, it said that his mm-hmm. father's family was Irish. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, following they came over following the Great Irish Famine. So yeah, yeah. So he so he's second generation white, and second generation on his land, right? Yeah, second. I think maybe third generation. I think his father may have been born here, so he may be third generation. But he's fairly. He's still fairly recent. His people was not here during the advent of the, um, you know, Revolutionary War or anything of that nature. So it was late, either late eighteen hundreds or early nineteen hundreds that they came over. Okay. He was born in nineteen nineteen. So it is a chance that his father was born. Um, Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Overseas, so, so, so yeah. he may still he may still be, you know. But he may have came over as a toddler. I mean, we don't know, right? No, he was born in um, San Francisco, California. Okay. So, so it's been uh, documented. Okay. You know who who knows, <laughs> but but yeah, his people come by way of um, Massachusetts, and then they moved out to California. So uh, mm-hmm. most most of them always come from the East Coast out west to. Uh, to get the gold, to get the gold, the gold rush during the eighteen hundreds. Yeah. So Yeah. Uh Western Empire. You know, the manifest mm-hmm. destiny. And a lot of them went out there to go kill natives as well. You know, that was their motivation too. <clears throat> but I found they, it um I think they just, tend to hide them under the gold rush. <clears throat> I yeah, wanna kinda, kill us. I wanna, you had killers traveling to go out there to do that. But anyway, I don't want to stick on that. Yeah, let me give context though. He served yeah. under President John F. Kennedy, so he was yeah. the Secretary of Defense during the Bay of Pigs, mm-hmm. and he also served the duration of Lyndon Johnson's term. So, just in case anyone Oof. think that uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson were not um, warmongers, murderers, uh, killers of people that were not white and were not all about the empire or the military um, complex, then you're sadly mistaken because he was the architect of these uh, massacres that did happen worldwide. Uh, T, did you did you have a, a quick comment before we get we jump into it real quick? Uh, no, just uh, listening in. So I, I guess I'll jump in once uh, as you all go on. Cool. Go ahead. So what I found interesting was that the matter of fact the matter of fact way that he spoke and I think that um another another point of reference that I would give people is if you want to see exactly what we mean when we say racism white supremacy and how big this thing is and how um the scope of it um being honest and being realistic about um what the lay of the land is and the reason why people feel the way they do now um you know you got to remember this is during the mccarthy era uh not too not too different than than what people are experiencing right now and i think that normally um which is you know a lot of a lot of the programs we we tend to go back as far as our program because we like to give people context as far as what you're seeing now um, in, in the form of Donald J. Trump, um, a, a unapologetic white person, representation of white, where he just, <laughs> he, he, he really don't care what you think, what, you, what you're talking about. Um, you know, I, I even think that people actually tell him what to say, and he gets up there and he just does his own thing. Um, he he just appointed a, another white male to the Supreme Court, very young white male. Um, you know, I think he's he he can. I don't even think he's out of his forties yet. So this, this gentleman, yeah. So this gentleman will be on the Supreme Court for the next thirty years, thirty to forty years. Like I mean, this is not uh, this is not rocket science, and and I think that. I think that what 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 we like to do with this cold with the cold breaker perspective with with us trying to decipher cold to look beyond the veil um look beyond whatever groups that you that you want to you know echo chambers that you that you tend to reside in the people that make the decisions are the people that you see at these press conferences 
the, the Secretary of Defense, the press secretary. These are people that have direct impact on your life. Forget about the rhetoric about speaking and doing all this and protesting. In my opinion, if you study the way this group moves, the war tribe, the people that, that kill overseas to establish empire, then you get a great idea of what this is. Um, the Fog of War is a great documentary in the sense that you have a, a man um, in the twilight of his life basically coming to grips with being a mass murderer, like literally confessing this, like he's in a tribunal, like he is basically spilling out the complexity of what an empire is and the weight of it even though he made logical and cold decisions. I think there was where he basically said that they destroyed, they destroyed half of Tokyo. Yeah. Like these, like these, like these cities, people that, that, that make these, these, these comments about Asian empires and they, they lost. They got like, their like, ass whooped. Like, like, like no, I, they, I'm lose. Not, they got I'm destroyed. Not, I'm not trying to cast <laughs> aspersions. Shout out to Stephen A. Smith, victim of racism. Very confused victim of racism, that is. But you have to understand the gravity of that. He's listing cities in conjunction to what they did. These are incendiary bombs. So he, he made a comment. I don't know. I couldn't really hear the clip. But in the clip, he makes a comment about most of the foundation, most of the buildings that was built at that time. Of course, mm -hmm. they are from the old country. So... Um, they were not built with brick and mortar, so you're not dealing with harsh, you know, material. You know, most of it is wooden, wooden areas, uh, plaster doors. Um, you know, if you look at the old samurai movies, Paper most of those foundations, yeah, you, you, the doors were made out of like a sheet. So if you put a fire to it, that's it. So the incendiary bombs, just to, to give you an idea, is just a fire bomb. Um, you know, just a big old firebomb that if you lay waste to a landmass that is covered um, with wooden houses or houses that are not, um, we have we have um, row homes in, in D.C. So if you, of course, if one, one row home caught, catch fire, to, you know this, you know, Paradox, you know this, what happens to the block? The block has a chance of coming down, the whole, the whole street. Mm -hmm. Because if it's wood and it's not brick, the only thing that's going to be remaining is the brick. Everything else is burned. Everything else is laid to waste. That's what that's what this is. And he's giving illustrations like we did this before we even dropped the nuclear weapons. It's not like they didn't they didn't already devastate. And we talk about multiple cities, cities that were people that were peaceful, people that were not fighting. Now, these were people that wasn't fighting. This is what we mean by the war tribe. A point has to be made. It's just like me and you walking outside. See, the the comparison is the comparison is incendiary. We're talking about incendiary bombs. The beginning of it, if you want to equate this, now think about the response that America has, 9-11, but think about that as just being the start of something. That's it. And just think about it constantly happening throughout. I mean, fifty percent of New York gone. 50% the inhabitants dead on arrival. This is before, um, you know, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. Yeah, so I think man, that I think that we we yeah we need to give credence to the the description of what took place during that time period. And, and what I would like to do is um, give my compensatory definition for. War, and uh, this is a compensatory definition. Um, I am not <laughs> an expert on war, but I had to come up with a definition that made sense for victims of racism because um, how else would you describe what has taken place um, to the group that is classified uh, as black and have to basically fall victim to uh, somebody else's definitions of who they are and what they will become in the future. So uh, let me let me get the definition of um, warfare. Hey, um, paradox. If you you want to make a comment before I give my uh, definition, um, you know, go go ahead. Uh, you summed, you wanna... Well, you summed it up pretty well. I don't I don't. Um, I would just say that 
um, if anyone spent time just watching um, the bombs being dropped, um, I mean, it it definitely it definitely does something to you to really to really show a group of people and what they're willing to do to control, to to maintain and or to establish power. You know, to put themselves in a position. Um, and have having the will to do it, having the, you know, it's it was. I know, man, you had talked about even with even with Vietnam, where you know, people made a decision. And in the European, and the reason we're calling them the War Tribe, is that at some time in history they made a decision. This is what we are. This is what we good at. And this is how we're going to handle our business. And that's just what it seems. And his, if you just if you just track it, I, I and again, I'm not a historian, so if you just track this through time. Just based off the little information that I have, um, that's this is what they do. This is what they do. This is this is you know they believe in being they believe in dominance. They believe in you know once they get access to technology, that their mindset is the way we do things is the best way. And if you don't do what we're asking you to do, we would we we will destroy you. We would destroy you to the point where you don't even have history. We would give you history. We would we would we would let you set things back up. If you look at some of the places in the East, which is is a lot more fascinating because you know it's just kind of them over there. It's, it's it's interesting that when they rebuilt their little empires, um, it had to be you know under Western control. It had to be um, approved basically uh, by the West. And so it's, it's, and again, I always say it's strange because they have ego over there. You know, if you don't, if you don't know what happened, you would think that uh, things, you know, they doing their own thing and that it's not interconnected, that they're not plugged in, that they're not being told what to do. They're independent. You know? they're, independent. they're independent. White so people that's, don't have no, no say so in what they're doing. All right. False. That's what it, that's Wrong. what it looks like on the surface, but it's like watching uh, the news or anything else like they're you think that they're telling you real information and they've created these narratives and scenarios to make you believe whatever you want to believe but when you did you just dig in a little bit it don't take much we're not saying we're not saying anything that's 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 really anything you know it's no. it's 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 more like just go look at the history and it's kind of in your face and if you even look at how they do do business now um they can put pressure really on whoever they want to put pressure on and don't get me wrong. and again I, I and you know what's crazy about it is that it's ongoing so am i am i going to sit here and say that people don't fight back don't fight back um at these people no but they're warmongers if you're not in the mindset to take them out completely if that is not your mindset they keep <laughs> coming and we have evidence of that all over the planet that they don't stop coming you beat What's them, the they most... come back. You beat them, they come back. I mean, these people are relentless, and I don't understand why the planet. I mean, at some point, it will click. I guess you know people do have their own interests. People are greedy, selfish. I guess all some of the some of the human some human traits that 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 unfortunately maybe keeps groups from maybe uh, looking at this group and saying, you know, well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna uh, connect and and just go all in. I don't think human beings are set up that way apparently i don't think nations and, and groups connect at that level don't know why maybe you know this is a human thing I, I i can't put my finger on it and it maybe just it just needs time for that to, you know maybe another thousand years uh for those events um to take place but i think that i think that we have to really look at these people um and I wouldn't use the word respectfully, but we would have to. We have to. We really need to take a real hard look at Let's white people, at the European. Really get a clear understanding of be how much power do they have, you know? And what's crazy about it is that when you look at it on paper, you would think that they should be the weakest group. You, you would think that they would be the weakest group when you think about some of these land masses and some of the and the sheer numbers of humans in certain places on the planet you would think that they would they would just be trying to jockey for for some crumbs so it's 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 
I would consider it even unusual. I think when you come from from you know from an American educational system, and you start to get more information, and you open your mind up a little bit, and you start thinking about things, you do start to wonder like, well, how how is this even possible? And I think thinking that sometimes probably makes you not want to believe it. It's like it's not possible, you know, because they will obviously they will get beat. Obviously, they will lose their power at some point. But to be able to maintain. And we go back even further. You want to go back uh, another two uh, two thousand years. I mean, you you can go back kind of far, maybe twenty five hundred years, depending on how you want to look at it. But you know, it's 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 been quite a stretch. And in the last seventy years, it's on some of it's on a level that I really can't process. When these group of people can go and kill and murder and bomb those many people simultaneously on this landmass, lynching hanging, torturing, terrorizing uh black people. Right? Can I, I'm ready Go for ahead. the uh the definition and um T I can feel you chomping at the bit. So I know you're ready, bro. But uh just just to kind of give people an illustration and we talked about this. This is way back before we even um started this program. We kind of got together and we was wanted to put a definition together now. Uh you know I know the fellas have uh, their variations of the definitions, but I like to give you the definition um, that that made sense for victims of racism um, that now that are now uh, classified or fall into the classification of uh, black. Um, the compensatory definition for war: two or more opposing forces or sides that are either trying to maintain, extract, or dominate the other, whoever that other is. The definition of those others or groups of people fall to the victors. Then the ones that are dominated or sexed into adapt to the customs of the oppressors, but don't have the capability to oppose until given permission by those oppressors. That's the definition, compensatory oh. definition. I don't know why I thought it was warfare. Be <laughs> I know it would. It, it sounded it a lot longer, short. but or oh, oh, the program is real condensed. Uh, T, uh, go go ahead, sir. Yeah, you know what's interesting is when you when you're dealing with the European, right? Now, I like to go back to antiquity a lot of times on things because it yeah. gives you a. To me, it gives you a more historical perspective. Obviously, we're dealing with the uh, the history that we've been provided, so. Sometimes you got to take things with a grain of salt, but with a lot of things, you can't throw the baby out with the bath water. So I can use that. I think that's a try to stay away from cliches as much as possible, but I'll use that one now. Um, with respect to the European, though, in antiquity, you're talking about a people who were, uh, from the very beginning, forged in battle. Their identity is, is war, a war based society. And we can go back to because we, you know, people talk about the military-industrial complex, and that that was what was that coined in the 20s, somewhere in the 20th century, 1900s. I believe that term was coined. But I was thinking about it. Yeah, I think it was Eisenhower. Was it Eisenhower? I, I believe you're right. Yeah, Eisenhower. But. People use that term as if it's uh, something new, you know, the military-industrial complex. But when I thought about it, I thought about you know uh, medieval times, for example, where you had. And I'm not even going to talk about prior to medieval times, like the Roman period or the Greek period. But in the medieval times, you had whole societies, I guess you'd call societies, they were enclaves, essentially, people walled up in castles and running a serfdom-type system. But when I thought about it, I said, well, when you look at, you had all types of military technology, you had chain mail, you had siege weapons, you know, battle battle rams to, to knock down castle doors, you had catapults, trebuchets, you had uh, all types of armor for knights. You had, I mean, all types of different military technology, swords and bow and arrows, crossbows. And so 
when I think about the term military industrial complex, I think about those things in antiquity and just I try to think what, what type of logistics does it take to produce that amount of weaponry, that amount of military technology and force. Now, obviously, in an in industrial period, you probably ramp that up a lot quicker, obviously, because you have machinery. But uh, I, ostensibly, I guess you had blacksmiths uh, hammering out uh, iron weapons and metal. Well, they, had, uh, they had a labor force. You know, they had a forced labor force back in those days, too. Blacksmiths, like you just said, that they forced into working. And, um, you Absolutely. know, these people were families. Yeah, they were families. They built swords and they were mistreated also. This is That was the bottom floor. That was the reason why it was so hard to maintain their dominance when they basically had the people that was at the bottom forging their weapons. Go ahead. Yes, and so military-industrial complex, maybe back to that term, because that that's a little bit misleading to me because I think you had a military-industrial complex even then. I think people uh, mistakenly apply that to, you know, recent, you know, century or so. That's that's and a great way to put it, by the way. Great way to put that. Yeah, I mean, it, just think about the amount of time and effort, the amount of labor it requires to build. I mean, you have huge catapults that can sling, you know, a, a rock that's a couple tons into uh, a stone wall by the way the castle was built by labor, too. I mean, you had masonry, you had to build those walls. And so what type of effort and time and technology, military technology, does it take to study that and see how much force it's going to take to knock down castle walls so I can go in and take what you have? Um, that, to me, is, is very interesting uh, to study that. But again, that goes back to my idea of the fact that I think the European, especially coming from an environment of scarcity uh, and a cold environment, you know, you talk about the, the Vikings, for instance, who came in and ransacked most of Europe. Yep. I mean, I mean, they they were all about killing. Most of their names even alluded to killing. And they only cared about one thing. They, I mean, they would they would take men, women, children. It did not matter. They would raid. They would. They had ships that they could uh, sail up into. They had a, a shallow draft, so they could sail up into very small bodies of water. And before you know it, you know, back then, obviously, you didn't have radar or any type of forewarning system, pre-warning system. And with a few minutes, you could be under attack by people with knives and, and swords, you know, um, and just ransack the place. Can I, so, can I say something? Can I say something kind of ignorant, uh, if you don't yeah. mind? I, I will say that um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to give Europeans... Um, any excuses to be monsters on this planet to be viruses and what I mean by that is cold weather and scarcity I just this is my own you know I don't know I don't know if it necessarily produces that behavior and the only reason why I'm saying that is that it's, it's cold all over this planet and a lot of other groups of people live in cold areas that have even less resources than they do in the in, in very you know in the most Nordic parts of uh, Europe and for some reason, even to this day, uh, those people do not have the same kind of appetite that that this group that this group has. But again, that's just my my opinion on that. No, that, I mean that's a great point. But but are we talking about in antiquity? Or are we talking about present day, where we can have access to grocery stores and you know uh, modern technology? Yeah, I'm, I, I mean that, I mean historically, I mean fifty thousand years back. I mean historically, as far as back as we can go. Yeah, I mean, I think I think an example of that would be maybe the Eskimos, uh, which would, they lived in a more, I think, a more isolated type of uh, society. But I mean, I think I think that some of it had to do with the fact that they did come out of a very uh, cold climate that restricted them in terms of abundance. Um, you know, the growing season was was relegated to a few months of the year. Uh, whereas if you come from a uh, Mediterranean type environment, quote unquote, the Levant or the the Middle East, then you you had year round uh, growing stages essentially. Uh, right. But when we look at places like uh, southern France and Portugal, we know that those are mild climates, right? Palm trees, nice weather, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of the most murderous people came 
out of Spain and Portugal. Right. Well, I believe they migrated down to those areas at some point. But uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, oh, I thought they came from either North Africa or from what we now call the Middle East or Syria. I think it should. I think it should be studied further. I believe they came down from from the north. Because I mean, you ha- you do have stories of I don't know how true they are because uh, it, it has ties to I guess it it sounds somewhat uh, fable. Uh, so it sounds somewhat like a fable when people talk about uh, people being kicked out of Africa because they were pale skinned <laughs> Yeah. So you know, I'm not sure where you want to go with that, but. I know that, that all that gets very all that gets very messy. I, I'm really I was just really kind of messing with you a little bit on the uh, no 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 it's, it's, on the cold on the cold weather thing. I just thought I always think it's strange that when you look at even historically uh, when you look at uh, weather patterns, I'm not I, that that could be a reason. I know that's that's a theory. I don't I don't know if it's it, it I don't know how valid how much validity that it has, but um, I'm not totally sure that uh, cold weather or even even living in ice uh, drives that behavior. But I can see how it does correlate. I can see how you can come to that conclusion, not you per se, but just the general consensus it seems. But I'm not I'm not all the way clear if it's not something deeper. Um, uh, you know, more so, more so than weather and, and, and scarce resources. But again, we don't have to kind of get, we don't have to really get bogged down on, on this conversation. I'll let you go ahead and keep going. Yeah, so, but, like, if you talk about, like, shock and awe, I remember after 9-11, and they were talking about going into Afghanistan initially, which they, they did drop bunker busters, all right, which, which are 1,000-pound bombs that the tip of it actually is a, a penetrative-type metal where it goes through, it can go through large amounts of earth before it actually explodes, so it doesn't explode on contact. Anyway... They went into Afghanistan and carried out bombing operations. Then all of a sudden, we were going to, into Iraq, and George Bush Jr. gave Saddam hey, Hussein. Hey, T. I'm getting off a tangent. Yeah. No, 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 no. T. Just for context, um, how many non-white countries have bunker busters? Just, just let me know. Uh, none, as far as I know. Have any of them ever tried to? use bunker busters against any European country that has colonized them or anything of that nature? I'm being mm, facetious maybe. here because I want I want I want to make it clear that that these weapons that are being used elsewhere, uh, these other groups are not allowed to use them on their land masses. The the closest thing that you have to it and I don't want to interrupt but I just want to give context is what you would call terrorism when it happens in a place that's more stabilized due to not being attacked on a regular basis. So anywhere where there is not, where the military is strong and there's an economy and then there's people doing things and there's white people that's protecting them outside of their borders, when you do things that is as a retaliation to warfare, clearly to what's happening um, to your groups of people, um, all over the planet, um, then then that would be considered terrorism. But think about this: um, people talk about drone strikes like there's no loss of life, and you know we talked about this before. There there is a movie called The Good Kill, where the psych the psychological um, weight of killing people, innocent people, um, people that's just walking around, women, children, everybody. Um, just to get a target is is taking its toll on people that's you know across the pond you know moving a a robotic um, drone that flies in airspace of people and drops bombs does that sound like terrorism to anybody I mean they show they have one they have one point where they show a bomb being dropped on a funeral they're they're burying somebody due to a drone strike and then they go back <laughs> and hit them with another drone strike during that funeral. Like, like, think about that. They're going to a funeral. 
the village or the group of people that stay around each other are going to a funeral due to a drone strike that happened earlier that week. Now, now, now Paradox, correct me if I'm wrong. As these groups are there, now, the, the terrorist or whoever you want to call them, or he or she that's there, is the target. You know, that's all that matters. All the rest of these people are, are you know, casualties Potter. of war. Right, casualties of war. That's not terrorism? That's not no, terrorism. It's not. You see you see what I'm saying? Like like that's what we mean by the definition of war. That's why we had to give another definition because things are being defined for you. Loss winner, of life is loss of life. The winner you dictates. Know what I'm saying? Now that's go what go said. go ahead, T. Yeah, go, go ahead, it, T. I, I'm sorry. I'm I, wanted, I, I wanna, get that. <laughs> right. Yeah, I wanted to get that back and forth. Go ahead, T man. I'm I want to know no more. You have some paradox then. No, I just was gonna say. Um, I was just gonna say that. Um, no, he had me thinking just about uh, what uh, the defense secretary was saying, just about how you know it's it's proven to you that the that the winner the win the winner the winner of these events get to dictate what's right, what's wrong, you know, what's up, what's down, etc. So I, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I mean, he just had me thinking about that. But go ahead, T. I didn't mean to interrupt. That's cool. What I was saying, though, I mean, in terms of uh, shock and awe, the draft of 9-11, they, they broadcast that on multiple channels. They showed the bombing campaigns in Iraq, and and which was it was a strange feeling I experienced because it was after 9-11, I felt like we were attacked, and I felt like we were getting payback. You know, um, got some background noise. And so it was a strange feeling because once I've become the more more aware of my surroundings and how I fit into the context and the framework of things, then I kind of reexamined that. But war is, is intricately tied into the society. I mean, from football games to, I mean, you name any type of sport. You've got the Super Bowl coming up, and you're going to have, and DC alluded to this in previous shows, you're going to have, Machines of death flying through the sky. These are not these, like he said. I mean, these are not just for show. These are actually military weaponry used to to kill. That's a, that's a fact. So that can't be dismissed. But it's celebrated, and it's it's so woven into the fabric that I think it's become a part of all of us. And even the shock and awe campaign. I bring that up because it was. It became entertainment for people. It became entertainment, and that's that's that. I think that's that drives home how difficult this thing is. And I, I just want to say one thing right quick and let you guys do your thing. Is that I um I had a conversation with a guy who was he was retired army. I think I believe he was a, a ranger, but he was a sniper, and he relayed to me a story about how. Because the guy's on uh, all types of psychotropic drugs because he relate he laid, relayed to me a story about how he had to go on a mission to actually, well, I'll put it this way. He had to take out a, a, a young girl who was probably, I think he said, around seven or eight. And he he wakes up pretty much every night, he says, having nightmares because he, he sees this young girl through the scope of his rifle and he's pulling the trigger. She has on. He says he has on some type of Philly type dress. He pulls the trigger, and all he sees through the scope is a big explosion. Basically, it's like a fifty caliber weapon, a Barrett rifle, sniper rifle, and it hits the girl. And if you see a fifty caliber hit somebody, you hit him in the head. Their head literally want to explode like a watermelon. And that's what he sees, and he wakes up screaming every night. So that. That's that's very graphic, but that's an illustration of um, what you're dealing with. Yeah, and I mean they had they, and and clearly they have um, plenty of people that are willing to, um, you know, to jump out there and put that work in. You know, I do. I always find it interesting that. Um, that when you look at this group of people, they don't have a problem. It, it's it's like you said, well, it's, it's normal. 
Um, it's like waking up and breathing in the morning. They they do tend to, you know, from a media perspective, do, you know, uh, make it appear that they're that they're struggling with themselves, um, you know, to fight. But I mean, if if somebody else was in charge of this thing and said, hey, you know, you guys have gotten beaten, let's go back and look through your history, and you were like, that's all you guys do is kill. You can't go five, two, three, four years uh, without having to um, to go out and kill somebody, and that's just at that level. You know, they're 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 killing us every day. So I mean, when you want to, if you if you look at our position under these people, um, and unfortunately, many of us p trying to participate, some forced to participate uh, in this environment um, and trying to be a part of. But you know, it's been continuous from the, from from the day they went into our land and started to um, um, take us away. However, however those events took place, um, and we got over here, um, it's been nonstop killing. And and really, the the, the strange part for for black people is that. That's all we might know. I'm not saying we do know that. I do know that we have a lot of people who who probably wouldn't hurt anybody. And it always is challenging for me to even wrestle, you know, kind of with the, you know, it's it's strange. You got some people who would never do anything. Um, others who have no problem. Some who are born into families that that's all they do um, is kill. Um, it's always just strange that in these types of, at these, these large scale societies, that um and i guess that is male and female that you have to participate in war if this uh, if these people tell you to and you have to protect um their assets i just, i just think it's a um it's a strange i would just say it's a strange thing when you really sit back and kind of think about the level of murder that you have to commit, and and you know what's even what was what's really strange is that the the reasonings behind it. So, you know, if you think I don't want, I don't, I'm not going to use animals as an example. I'm just stick stick to, stick to humans. But it's it's strange that you can have something where it you know you, you got somewhere, um, you have access to land, you can feed yourself and clothe yourself, and it's not enough. There's something in you that tells you that you need more, or you need to control more or you need to control everything to to possibly uh protect yourself for some reason your own and in, your own internal uh paranoia your own internal fear because you know dr wilson makes a point about how the european goes into the world and sees people on the planet uh with color in their skin and yeah. sees that they can yeah. be they can be uh genetically That's annihilated it. <laughs> That's it. Is that, that is it. <laughs> well, the question is: Is that the trigger? Is that is that the? It, and I'm asking it in question form because I don't have no answers. This can this I, be I, clear. This this program. Uh, let me just say this: This program yeah, go ahead. is not to give you answers. I'm not here. I, I'm telling. I mean, I I cannot stress that enough. Uh, we are. Uh, well, I wouldn't say speak for the people on the line, but as far as my myself, I'm just trying to get a better understanding of history, a better understanding of of, of what's going on. Just trying to get a different vi a different view or perspective. Trying to change the way my brain is really wired um, to try to see these animals as for what you know to see them for what they are and to see how they influence non-white people on the planet, specifically. Uh, African American. I'm looking at our group of people that we have. We have to deal with these monsters on a daily basis, and we are infected, and we get infected, and their bloodline runs through a large percentage of us, and that's something that we always have to deal with. And you know, anyway, I, I hold, I hold right there. I know we're getting close to the turn, but uh, did, did you go ahead? Did you have something on your mind? Yes, I, I, I really want to, to really speak through. Um, the secretary and we, we're about to kick off into break in a minute but I want to go through some of the um, what he called the lessons the lessons uh, additional lessons from um, R.S. McNamara Mr. Strange uh, I'm pretty sure he got picked on as a child but um, speaking to what you were saying about um, 
the amount of violence that's used and the ability to um, to disconnect and, and to think about life in a sense of to establish peace, we have to kill mm -hmm. so we won't be attacked. Mm -hmm. So he has That's his mindset. first, his first, his first lesson. His first lesson. Now think about how how the group that has classified themselves think about everybody else, and just think about the statement that I'm about to read. Now this is Robert Robert S. McNamara in his own words. His own words. You can have an opinion about what you think he meant, but I think he's clear. Uh, the human the human race will not eliminate war in this century, but we can reduce brutality of war, the level of killing, by adhering to the principles of a just war. In particular, the principle of proportionality. Now, you have to be pretty dominant over groups of people to say that the way we dish out to groups of people has to be proportion to the ability to kill. I, I would actually go as too far as to say the Vietnam conflict, which he admits in the fog of war where they killed over 3.5 million Vietnamese, North and South Vietnamese people, people that are classified as not white because they had a civil war dispute and they had connections to communist Russia at the time. And America looked at it as a communist conflict that Russia could not get a hold of that country, that they had to enforce or impede they will get involved. And the reason why they did not go into whole nuclear fallout, in, in my honest opinion, because this was a decision that they did make, I am not white, I'm a victim of racism, um, was due to the, to the nuclear fallout that happened in in um in World War II. If they drop bombs on Vietnam, that would destroy the whole infrastructure. So they fought and they lost massive life. Now, as everybody knows, uh, people that are classified as black, if you have relatives that's been here for a while, you may have a relative in your family that fought in this conflict during the 60s and the 70s. Um, and in the 50s, there was the Korean War. Same thing. The Korean and the Vietnam War of basically North Korea, South Korea, North Vietnam, South Vietnam. And these groups of people refused. They'd rather die than to basically be subjugated. They called it slavery. Clear, clear understanding about what was happening to them. Now, Vietnam, now we already know, and Korea also, are basically... Western carbon copies now. Um, you know, you'll have items built in Vietnam, China. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know about Korea, but I do know that uh, Vietnam, oh, Korea. you know, Ch China and all these places, they do basically build things and they have a labor force. And this is all connected to how things are going to be run in these places after warfare because the pieces had to be put back together. How do we piece our how do we piece our humanity back together when we had clans? Clans were like tribes in these in these areas that we now call Asia. We we don't even have a understanding. That's why that's why I'm like it's it's so confusing because we're calling people Asian when they didn't have a classification of being that before, just like we call ourselves black, but we have people that's from the tribal the tribal affiliations in Africa that never looked at themselves that way. So when you sit up here and say that blacks sold themselves in slavery, that's a false statement. That is a statement that is not true. Due to the actual advent of people that are on the African continent at that particular time, and it wasn't even called Africa, but they're on that landmass at that particular time, dis distinguished themselves through tribal affiliations. They will be just as different as anybody else. Anybody else. We are not those people over there. We are completely different people. Now, the group that classified themselves, that they begin to classify themselves as white, the European, the people that's going into conquest, they all looked at it at the same way, empire. This is all about dominating this group of people. These are primitive people. Some of them are peaceful. Most of them are peaceful. They live out in the, in, in, in the surrogate, the, the jungles, or whatever you want to call it. 
they're not they're not affiliated together in the same kind of you know congruent landmass because you cannot dominate a group if they were all together if we all knew what was going to happen at that particular time that they was going to classify all of us as black would you have the nerve to disrespect our ancestors to that level to say hey go ahead you're not going to benefit from slavery because right when you capture whoever your tribal um you know your rival tribe is we're going to come back for you also all right this is the code breakers on black talk radio going to break Radio since 2008, providing new black media for the masses. Uh, all right, this is the Cold Records. We are back. We are discussing the warmongers, the white supremacists, the white people as a whole group, the European, however you want to classify those people. Um, DC, I still got DC on the line as well as T. Um, before we start, um, uh, Mr. Reed, did you get a chance to get that? I just sent you a second email. I want to run that, run that clip if we could. So I don't know if he's, he's listening to me at this point, but anyway, um, we do have a couple of more clips that we do want to You play. know what the number we one. We might get a chance to get those in. I'm not sure at this point. Uh, T, did you have? Did you have? Did you want to make any additional comments? Oh, I think I've got Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed, you there? Yes. Did you get that? I just sent you a yeah, second email. Yeah, I got email it queued up. With that, say say that again. I'm sorry. It's queued up. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's go before you respond. T, I want to play that I clip, have... and we can jump from there. I think it should be about two minutes and nine seconds. If I'm not mistaken. I'd like to talk a little bit about the war in the Persian Gulf. Big doings in the Persian Gulf. You know my favorite part of that war? It's the first war we ever had that was on every channel plus cable. And the war got good ratings too, didn't it? Got good ratings. Well, we like war. We like war. We're a warlike people. We like war because we're good at it. And you know why we're good at it? Because we get a lot of practice. This country's only 200 years old and already we've had 10 major wars. We average a major war every 20 years in this country, so we're good at it. And it's a good thing we are. We're not very good at anything else anymore. Huh? Can't build a decent car, can't make a TV set or a VCR worth the fuck. Got no steel industry left, can't educate our young people, can't get health care to our old people, but we can bomb the shit out of your country, all right? Especially if your country is full of brown people. Oh, we like that, don't we? That's our hobby. That's our new job in the world, bombing brown people. Iraq, Panama, Grenada, Libya, you got some brown people in your country, tell them to watch the fuck out or we'll goddamn bomb them. Well, when's the last white people you can remember that we bombed? Can you remember the last white? Can you remember any white people? We've ever bombed. The Germans, those are the only ones. And that's only because they were trying to cut in on our action. They wanted to dominate the world. Bullshit. That's our fucking job. That's our fucking job. Now we only bomb brown people. Not because they're trying to cut in on our action, just because they're brown. (laughs) 
Oh, I think that might I think we might be good on that clip. Um can I can I say something real quick? Sure. And um I think that um you know, I know a lot of people they like they like hearing um it's not even <laughs> If you listen to the truth of um, that clip, and um, was that CK? George Carlin. Yeah. George Carlin. Great, great, great. Uh, George Carlin has now passed on. Um, you know, I think CK does comedy like that too. Uh, they're they're very honest about um, white people. And I'm not gonna, you know. <laughs> Victims of racism, we have to, um, no, 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 no. We don't have to do anything. Um, what I what I would suggest is to um, look at look at how this country was established. Um, the things that you're defining, the things that we define ourselves as, is based off a faulty paradigm, a faulty um, definition that was forced upon us. And um, I mean, we're here now. There's no changing what has happened but you cannot erase what took place prior to getting here because when you do that um, in my opinion we do a disservice to our ancestors and it's not this is not about um, being extra emotional being like you know we hate white people um, our mentor um, our, our our shero Dr. Francis Cress Wells and uh, gave illustration and and I and, and you know me paradox and T we used to wonder why does she keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again why is she just doing that and she knew where we was at mentally as a as a group of people the patients the 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 um the wherewithal to understand how our group have been mentally shattered to the point where we do a lot of showcasing um, a lot of bragging a lot of you know bravado and we wonder why in neighborhoods that are tore up by um, our youth and the reason why they, they, they're so um, aggressive because of being powerless you know it's hard to lie to children and when a child can see themselves as being powerless and stuck in the situation, they really don't care what you're talking about. You know, it's all about survival at that point. Whatever survival is, even if it is destructive or not constructive. And and this is not to to blame anyone for whatever they're doing, but you know, great, great point. And as Mr. Scott we just alluded, white people were falling out laughing he said clearly we will bomb the shit out of you facts true you can feel however you want to feel about that this is a fact see I think that the dominance has been so 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 clear so prevalent that that we want to become white people we want them to accept us as white part of the we want to be part of the Warren tribe so we're, we're asking for clear acceptance into this because there is going to be a fraction of us that do not want to be connected to this group and then there's going to be part of us that is want to be connected and I'm not talking about people that work at nine to five every day I'm talking about people that believe in empire that happen to be classified as black you know damn it I'm an American I want to go, I want to be able to do things. I love my so-called freedom. So, you know, when you have black people celebrating um, the Muslim ban, um, you guys know that a lot of people that are classified as Muslim are part of the African diaspora, right? Just, just for people to just give context. Oh, well, no, those are not us. Those are not, those are not our people. Okay. That 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 goes that that goes down. There are American Muslims also. 
there are people that's going to be mis, mis, uh, misqualified. There's going to be people that are going to um, that's going to fall in and out of classifications now. So who makes the decisions on who is and who isn't so-called Arab, if that even is a real thing in a true context of classification? Do you think? Do you think? Yeah. Now, just be interested to see. I mean, you talk about the um, immigration policies. I know. I know we're talking about war, but I, I'm sh this kind of falls in with it. Absolutely. The fact that we we don't deal with the causative issues, so people will look at the immigration. They call them migrants now, which is almost, I think, derogatory. So they don't call so-called white people uh, who came here migrants. They call them immigrants. Or as Paradox put it, so aptly put it, occupiers. Yep. Um, anyway, <laughs> these people are fleeing their country. If you look at the southern countries that are on the list, mostly in the Middle East, North Africa, these are all countries that are under siege by guess who white people. I mean, the people the people aren't just coming to these these, uh, these countries trying to escape their own country because they you know the ice the, the ice is colder there I mean these people had livelihoods you know I'm sure they had industry you know whether they have it on a, a lower scale not a lower scale but on a lesser scale like a you know a communal type uh, set up you know, where they grew their own food. And and you had military come in there and decimate the place. Depleted the depleted uranium, uh, you know, dropping dropping you talk about Vietnam, dropping napalm, Agent Orange. I mean just mass destruction. What what are, what are people supposed to do? And that just goes to show the power of racism, white supremacy, because at the end of the day, they still have to subjugate themselves and beg to come into these, these other countries to seek refuge. Totally powerless. And they plan, and they plan with you as well, because places like Canada and other places, they oh, we'll, you know, we'll take you in, you know, a bunch of gamesmanship. I don't, you know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, uh, the, when you really look at it, you can definitely, when you have better vision on it, you almost you can see the insanity of how it's a lot of moving parts. You can see the insanity of, of how they play. You know when you have that when you have that amount of power uh, to have the ability to play with people. Unfortunately, and unfortunately, you know, you know, go ahead, go ahead. You know what's interesting about that too is that playing both sides of the of the game is what they're doing, as you were alluding to, paradox and. The fact that you have all these uh, so-called migrants coming into even like Europe, say European nations, classically you know, European nations, is that it actually strengthens the ideology of, of racism and white supremacy because you have people who are classified as white in these countries who look at these uh, these quote-unquote migrants. Take Paris, for example. They, I mean, they labeled these tent city jungle camps or jungle uh, city, something to that effect. So you can see the dem demonization and the wording there, but it strengthens it because simply to the fact that when people classified as white, look at that, they say, look at these animals. I mean, they're living in the street, they got refuge, uh, uh, garbage everywhere, you know, they don't have a job, you know, they're not contributing to society, we, we offer them, we let them come into our country and look what they're doing with it. This is ridiculous. And so that just, it, it, it sets up a dichotomy where it not only does it strengthen that ideology of racism and white supremacy, but it also contributes to racial dislocation, confusion, which Millie Fuller, for those who are familiar, gets into racial uh, dislocation and how that breaks up the so-called black family, among other things. Keep them, well, keep them moving. Keep them moving. Keep them moving. 
keep it moving. That way you can never actually have a, a true community or actually set something up that's going to be enduring like an institution. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the other, you know, the, the, the other unfortunate part is that, uh, well, you know, I wouldn't say unfortunate. I, I just pose it this way. I just want to see what you guys' responses are. But they use non-whites to fight their wars. And that's across, that's across the planet. Clearly, clearly us, but that's, that's pretty much worldwide. They use non-whites to fight much of their wars and uh and die in their wars which is still hard for me to process but it is what it is but um and i was thinking the day about um when you have warfare so i think somebody had mentioned shocking also more a, a more recent war which is when the uh when the europeans went in, went into the land that they already own and control and somebody there didn't want to be obedient, I guess, and they decided to kill them, or whatever. I don't know. I don't know the facts. But anyway, uh, I believe they did bomb Iraq, uh, killed the family who they put in charge and, and of of running it. Uh, maybe they were being disobedient. Not not clear on that. But um, you know, I was thinking that when they bombed them, those people, many of those people there. Uh, had to escape, had to run away, had to pack things up, and had to uh, to move. For the most part, I know many stayed and many have came back. But anyway, I was just thinking that in this nation, I've heard, you know, on the airwaves and in other places that we are under siege, specifically black people. Um, we are under siege or we're being attacked. Do, you know, and I know we had some migrations and some things that have happened in the past when it was... Uh, maybe it was it was I want to say more or less, but it, it, it was a situation. So we so we decided to to to, to uh, make some moves. Some of us do do we have you know I know things do tie back to slavery and to Jim Crow, but we still had the propensity to to go north or to go west uh, in this nation. You even go very north in in some situations, but. And, and obviously some other places as well. But anyway, um, do you do either? You think that indiv maybe individually, maybe being a part of capitalism, maybe being you know, you know, uh, going to Amer American education, maybe being from a, a, a black Christian family, maybe uh, having certain ideologies about this land and, and whatever you think and however you've been trained to think that there's no more movement that I know of in law, I haven't, you know, I've thought about it, or maybe I'm missing something, but there hasn't been any large movements specifically of uh, black people. Now, I do know that you have other non-whites that migrate here due to events that are going on wherever they're coming from that much of this place is involved in, which is even crazy, which is really crazy when you think about it. But all over the planet, you know, people are, you know, in some degrees, people are, people are moving in, in, in large mass and in, in others, they're doing what they're doing as far as fighting, etc. But for our group here, specifically here in the United States, um, do we, do we, are we seeing any of that movement? And if that movement is happening, is that being hidden? Or is it being hidden from us by the media or, or other outlets? And we just can't. We're not. We're, we're maybe missing that movements are happening. I know gentrification obviously is a forced uh, thing that's taking place, but um, us as large groups or collectively haven't at this point decided to make our next transition. Do, does anyone have a, a comment on it? I know that that's not necessarily. I mean, I would say it's tied to war, but not at some of the scale that we're talking about. But at a, at a at a slightly lower scale. Uh, than Hiroshima at a slightly lower scale here, the way they attack us, the way they have things structured to, to move us around, uh, to put us in particular types of environments, and even even if they promote us, you know, President Obama, Colin Powell, or whoever, whatever name you want to pull out of a hat that runs a company, or is a is an educator, or is a dean of a college or whatever, whoever you want to pluck out, or, any, or anyone on the call for that matter, uh, who, who has more access, uh, are we? Do y'all think that that's even even an, even a thought at this point? You 
see you want to take that yeah well i i would just say that um i mean it goes back to to who do people define themselves as and i think that that's where that's where we at now there's too many different um people have too many different fragmented solutions to whatever their so-called problem is. But at the end of the day, um, my argument is the warring tribe, the white supremacists, uh, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call these people, uh, but these groups of people that are classified as white, if you look at the Senate, if you look at the House of Representatives, if you look at the the people that are making decisions um, that are that are on your that are on your newscast, even when um, the 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 black person known as President Obama was in the White House, he was surrounded by all um, white people. When you when you're dealing with a situation as as such, where you're compromising at all times, but you're clearly defined and then limited per your classification of being so-called black. Um, I don't think that there is any kind of coalition that can build up within there, within but that, without not, without being without being noticeable is what I'm saying. Like not based on what you just said, because the thing is, I think the top one, the richest families, are all white on this planet, in this particularly in this country. Um, I know you have some other groups that have have some wealth on the planet, but uh, specifically here, you know, you have very few people that hold all of the resources and all of the wealth. That's not enough to make them to to get people to move. You're talking about other groups of people that are not um, within that class of the most powerful people that hold all the resources. The ninety nine, the, the uh, top one percent is what you're speaking about. Yeah. The reason why the ninety that's that's what I'm saying. The definitions. Um, we are we are classified by race. Race is the the white supremacy is the dominant um, thought pattern on this globe, on this planet. So people that are classified as white, even though there are um, massive, massive numbers of white people that are broke, just like massive numbers of black people that are broke, no, what I, that cannot what I, come together and co uh, you know build a coalition together because of you know. The no, not, yeah, not no, no, not white, not white people coming together. I just mean that you have billionaires in Mexico, you have billionaires in India and China. You have people who have a lot of wealth and resources. Okay, uh, but it just seems that the way it's structured, I don't want to use. I won't. I won't say that it's limited, but it can cause confusion because if I'm if I'm Indian or Nigerian or Mexican, as far as the the words that we use today. Um, and I had, and I'm worth billions of dollars. Um, the argument is that within, you know, is it is it just the accumulation of wealth and resources? Is it the assertion of military might? And then is it the fear of the people that keep that keeps people from not moving? And what I mean by that is that if we if we believe that we live in this country, we believe that this country exists. This is a real place. And we don't have any resources. Not all of us, but we'll say ninety percent of us may not have resources. Maybe, maybe higher. Specifically, black people. Why would we not just go and deal with other things? What What's not moving the group to say, well, that's what I was saying. Is it religion? Is it fear? Is it what what we're talking about on this call doesn't really exist, and they don't really have no power, and these wars never happen, and they're not in charge, and you don't speak their language, and you don't operate the way they do, and you don't have suits, on, you know, and it all came from Africa, blah blah, whatever you're gonna say to function in this environment, just contrasting those things. So you know, on one Love hand, go, but, go ahead, T. Love your yes, sir. I wanted to interject if I could. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Who um, do you, would you like for us to? Uh, you have like a name that you go by, or? Uh, yeah, I was about to share that. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Please share. Now, this is uh, <clears throat> Rob chiming in from Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And uh, greetings to uh, everybody on the line and uh, to the listeners. And. Um, just building on what the last caller spoke on, um, I think that um, divide and conquer, um, in my opinion, would sum it up. 
And I think that it's a uh, accumulation of all things like religion, um, people um, really not even recognizing that it is a problem. Um, and um, <clears throat> I wanted to throw a question out there um, that I heard um, raised is like um, the non, like the system of white supremacy, right? Um, indeed, if there is a system and we live it under that system, like how is that affecting the non-white people and, and how is that playing out? Um, and I'm asking that question because specifically um, it seems that um, my problem is um, coming from trying, attempting to be, quote unquote, a man um, under this system. And my problem is coming um, from the independent black female and I hate to say it but as I look at my life um, ever since my mother um, it's been like <clears throat> man, almost a constant castration um, at every turn and um, that's all I wanted to add thank you thanks, thanks a lot for sharing we appreciate it um I guess uh, just to just to kind of um, build on your point, and I, I may just ask you to kind of give me a little bit more clarity. But you did ask um, about the system first, right? Like, if there is a system that exists, white supremacy, um, how does it affect non-white people? Is that is that like what you wanted to kind of get some clarity on, like what what we feel like how it was affecting? Well, yes. Yeah. As, as the program where we're called the Cold Breakers and you know we we have an idea that the system is primarily psychological um, the system don't exist without participation this is just along with anything money don't money don't hold no weight anything that you do you have to get people to move and motivate humans to move a certain way so things are created nationality religions things that's going to motivate people to move so does that does that sort of make sense I'm going to go a little bit further but is that kind of like giving you an idea of where we're coming from with this when we think about the system of racism white supremacy how things are being defined how how they have imprinted their their ideology on a group of people that are still oppressed in this particular landmass and how we don't constantly attack this group of people that have clearly mistreated our relatives, our ancestors. It's no, it's no illusion here. There, there is, there is so-called neighborhoods in all major cities in the United States that are basically depleted. People don't want to send their kids to schools. Black kid, black people don't want to send their kids to black schools. I mean, think about that. So, what about the people that are left in these communities? I guess that's just for these people making all the wrong decisions, right? Then what about their parents? And then what about their parents? I see that's that's what we're talking about. Everything has a a root cause. Like people are just not acting this way in Chicago. This is not brand new. I mean, <laughs> if you're old enough to remember, people well, you don't even have to be old enough to remember. They show good time reruns all the time. And if 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 I'm not mistaken, that family was originally from Mississippi, the rural part of Mississippi. Jay was not able to get into the unions. He was not able to work. Um, he was a father that was there. So, you know, there was all kinds of, you know, negativity happening around him. Now think about when Michael or JJ, even though they grew up in that environment with a father, they grew up in the projects and then they have kids. You see what I'm saying? And then those kids have kids. That's what you're looking at. That's what we're that's what we're talking about. You know, even though Thelma was fine, you know, this is this is this is what this is what ends up happening. Because most likely Thelma had kids. If you're talking about the real story of good times, Thelma had a rack of kids. You know, and 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 then you know, JJ probably had kids too, probably by different women. 
you know, that generation of males was from the pimp era, dino might. Everything was basically getting on women, macking ladies, searching for what you what you just described, manhood. So the system is um, psychological, in my opinion. Um, you know, what, what we suggest is for people to do the best that they can wherever you at in the system. Um, if you can help, if you can help it, try not to mistreat the most vulnerable part of our group, which is the um, population that is um, classified as black that are from these 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 communities that are basically locked in. And just to, just to speak, I'll, I'll let you go, Paradox and T, just a moment, just to give you a quick um, preference on the black woman. Um, you know, I understand your angst when it comes down to that. But just think about the the responsibility that's been pushed on to the black woman and think about the weight of that and I'm pretty sure you have women in your family you know whether they they, they were um, what we call mentally healthy or not mentally healthy they did the best that they could do and that we have to be empathetic to the plight of that because it's generational now this is something that has basically ran like two to three generations in now so it's it's locked in this pattern of behavior that we have as a powerless group and when like you said if you have a man that's not able to strike out and and do his own thing due to the system of racism white supremacy um if and we think that there is one well we know that there is one due to the evidence and logical reasoning um then the 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 gender mirror which is the black woman is going to look at us in that way which the psychological damage that happens is basically twofold. Was that was that was that clear? I'm sorry. Was that was that clear? Uh, yes. Did I answer the question? Okay, cool. Go ahead, Paradox. I'll just. What well, T? Did you have anything? Yeah, no, I just just to uh, say to the gentleman uh, from Milwaukee, we appreciate you calling in, and uh, to to the question. I mean, well, the statement, I guess, about. Um, women classified as black um, the thing to understand is that because we are within the system of racism white supremacy our relating is automatically going to be skewed one to another and what I notice is that people's in this system people's value is based on their income their level of income in fact there was there's times when I've been un, unemployed especially the first time I went through it, it was, it was very depressing. And because I started realizing how much I identified with having a job and how that gave me value in society and how, how much that controlled me. In other words, my, my intrinsic value was not based upon what I, you know, and this, this even sounds foolish for me to say this, but my intrinsic value did not lie in what I could offer the world or offer other people in terms of helping them, you know, speaking with them, having conversations, being someone who uh, is what you might call upstanding and not um, inflicting damage on the, on his or her community. And so when you when you're dealing so and we know that in large part, and I, I'm not sure how it is in Milwaukee, maybe you can uh, shed light on it, but I know in, in our area, especially with all the government buildings and what have you, there are a lot of so-called black women in leadership positions and also in positions that garner a large income. You know, they make a lot of, a lot of money. And so when you're dealing, and there's nothing that's wrong with that, but when you're dealing with a system that is uh, built upon how much you make, then when you have more so-called black women in those type of positions and less black men in those type of positions, and we can get into all the reasons why that might be, but when you have that, that automatically alone, without getting into other factors, can cause uh, a, a skewing of uh, relationships. Go ahead. <clears throat> May I interject one second? Go ahead, brother. Um, who, the, what's your name that's speaking right now? This is T. 
key. That's um, you hit the nail on the head. That's what I'm struggling with right now. Thank you. Sure, well, again, no well, again, this is the Code Breakers on Black Talk Radio Network. Um, you can reach us at one eight six six five one zero nine zero two five and hit, uh, I think it's star star uh, to speak. You can obviously go and download us, uh, our podcast on blacktalkradionetwork.com. Definitely do that. There's also some other programs on it that, that you will find uh, very informative. You can reach us. I, let me see. We are on live first and third Tuesdays. At 9 p.m., you can email us at codebreakers1999 at gmail.com. You can, uh, on social media, I think we are codebreakers191 on Twitter and codebreakers underscore 1865 on, um, on Instagram. Uh, you can also find us on codebreakers um, on Facebook. If you look up codebreakers, you'll also find us there. And we're going to go to break. podcasts and live program scheduling visit us on the web at blacktalkradionetwork.com racial dislocation keep them moving people who are forever on the move through eminent domain urbanization uh, urban renewal gentrification are here again drying up the river. You build a dam 800 miles up and the river seals off the water behind the dam. I mean, the dam is sealed off uh, the river is sealed off behind the dam. So that means that all the people down in the valley there, they don't get any water. They need water. They depend on the fishing industry. So now they have to come and work for you because there's no more water there, no more fish. And you give them minimum wage and uh, a promise for the future as long as they look up to you. So they'll know they're completely dependent. But keep them moving. If a black person in the Northwestern Hemisphere starts getting that second generation house, then you come through and say you gotta build a highway. That's the technique. All right, the Code Breakers, we are back. Uh, we do want to say uh, thanks to Mr. Reed and Black Talk Radio Network for letting us put on the program. Um, I would just say, um, as I always say, one of my coaches that I don't, I don't uh, spend too much time commenting on uh, on black women if I don't have a black woman on the call. But I will also say that, uh, in my opinion, the black woman is God. They give us life. Um, I was praying to one of my ancestors uh, today, uh, one of my grandmothers, and um, uh, just just for um, just for for better understanding. But anyway, not to go down that road. But I, I would just I, I would leave that there. Um, anyway, um, from a warfare from a warfare perspective, um, fellas, I know we got a, probably about maybe about twenty minutes left. Um, did you had? Did y'all have any other, any other um, positions or statements that you wanted to make um, about the warmongers? Matter of fact, D, we probably. I don't know. Do you remember how we even hit? How, what what made us even? Uh, uh, I think we were having some kind of discussion, and it kind of clicked. Real, you know, not necessarily coming to to a realization, or maybe, but just just was thinking, kind of like, well, man, this is a. Uh, you know, that's all these people do is kill. Um, do you remember that that conversation at all? Well, it's always been like the 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 same thing, basically. That that I think we was talking about uh, Donald J. Trump, the the president, and um, how he exude uh, whiteness in a certain way that that. Um, President Obama could could never um, exude due to him not being classified as white, um, regardless of whatever your opinion was of uh, President Obama and um, his policies. Um, he did not; he was not a white person. So I think that we just talked about how the differences is as far as like how he came in there doing things and 
don't really care about um, your feelings. Don't care about how you feel. Um, he probably think it's real amusing too when people protest and things of that nature. So, well, I he's think gonna... we was having a discussion about that, and then oh, kind of yeah. like we went into um, an idea about um, how when we think about the politics and the general politics that are going on here, how basically everything that is established. Oh, I remember we was talking about the women's march and how. Um, you know everything that we that we're protesting or that we're that we're defining is based off uh, warfare, and that the warfare that basically happened um, during during the time that President Obama was in office still gives people enough room to to um, share their grievances in a in a in a manner where there's no killing involved because the power the power is basically so so prevalent here at this point that they can totally separate it and allow people to kind of purge their feelings out without there being any kind of disruption as far as like uh, the system is concerned like we said we say it's participation um, there's no threat to things being shut down on a mass level and that's the reason why um, I think in my opinion uh, we, we decided to do this program oh, okay alright that makes that makes uh, um, that make that makes that does make some sense, because you know every time I see something on television, you know the TV, I tr- I'm trying my best to avoid all news stations. I did get sucked in uh, over the last few days, unfortunately, and I had to wash my try to wash my brain out as much as I can because this stuff, man, they if you get you know you getting a constant dose of of lies and nonsense, man, it has your brain. Your brain is so. I don't even know. I don't even know how to. What? What? The, clearly, it's not meant for us to be receiving this amount of this much information. Oh, don't I, forget I, about I, Russia too. We talked about Russia. I yeah, think that's about enough. Russia. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it's just just a strange thing uh, when we think about. Um, um, you think about warfare. You think about what what's required. The amount of risk that 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 it takes, and and really, you think as well as what what has to be done to you to want you to want your group or a portion of your group you know to fight you know to 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 be willing to put their lives on the line i think that when you when you move into that kind of conversation i know things get a little dangerous we are on the internet etc but um you know even when i think about um um having children and thinking to myself you know this black woman is going to produce my my fighters, my warriors. You know, she's the one that's going to bring that to fruition. So it's just a, it's a fascinating thing that when you're willing to produce children, um, even to have you know, knowing that you're going to go into war, knowing that there's a plight on this planet, and you know, and again, we we we've established, I should say, not we, but there's groups of people who on this planet who have st- who who has who has made it there their their life their life's work you know obviously through religions and things of that nature but whatever they need to use um they they proclaim things and they they've made statements and they and they put themselves out there at the at the state level um you know to say that we're, that we will fight to the death if we if we have to so you know we do have a lot of examples out there you know one one day you know i think that we're all going to uh you know get together you know, go and and uh, and knock these prisons down. Even you know, even something to that to that to that fact internally, that at some point you know we're gonna get tired. At some point, you know we're gonna get the strength. You know that steel spine, as I say, uh, you know to, to take the risk, whatever that's gonna look like. Um, it's gonna be messy. You know, we and, and you know I'm not a, obviously a warfare expert, but just looking at a little bit of warfare. The amount of sacrifice that's going to be involved, and and even and the division, you know, I think that, and I'll let you you guys either, you know chime in where you want to, but I think that um, the illusion, possibly, possibly, that you know every single person of color, if you want to label it that way, um, is going to die for an idea um, that we might develop. That's never going to probably happen, and, you know. Obviously, in war, you have divisions, so people will take sides. And I always think, what what would even be our 
what would even be our position? You know, clearly the white supremacists, the white European, the white American, they already they've already told us what our ideas should be, what we what we should think and what we should fight for based off of their system. But as far as the black people who are listening to this phone, listening to this uh, message right now, I want to know, you know, what are we you know, what is the idea um, to create separation? You know, what is the idea? Because up until now, I, I don't know. You know, it may be a thousand years before we find that idea, but we are searching for it. But you, you have something to say? DC or, or T? T. Uh, well, you know, in terms of uh, continuing on the topic of war, and that's obviously, at least I, in my estimation, a uh, topic that can be um, covered ad nauseum um, because it's very expansive. And it, 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 it's interesting because just knowing human nature and how, and someone may disagree with this statement, but I feel that there's something in all humans that can tend toward an animalistic type behavior. I mean, or there are controlling factors that may be over top of that to prevent them from leaning toward that side of, of, of their their nature. But is it even possible to run a society without a military? And I mean, you, you can obviously have a defensive force. If you talk about, like, for example, Iran, Iran who, Iran, a.k.a. Persia, which I don't think they've started a war of aggression in over 200 years, roughly. However, the only the only nation in the world who sanctions people for nuclear weapons development or even the thought of them possibly, if they think you're developing some type of nuclear program, they will sanction you. But there, but this is the only nation in the history of the world, as far as we know, that has actually used atomic weapons on another uh, another nation. And so, yet and still, they want to be the the moral judge in terms of how other people develop, maintain, or use nuclear power. So, but getting back to what I was saying, is it even possible to have a society without some type of militaristic bent? Because there are a lot of, you know, in terms of the people going and fighting for this nation, people go into the military for various reasons. And a lot of times, at least in my experience from seeing family and friends, what have you, is that that, is that the, uh, excuse me, the military is the default. So when people fall into disarray, they, you know, they have trouble finishing school. And there's a lot of reasons behind that, obviously. They don't finish school. They get in trouble with the law. They're not sure what to do with their life. What do people say? Go join the military. And not only that, but some people have economic issues. Most people do. And so the benefit of the military, they offer a lot of different things for people who go in. They pay for your schooling. You know, I, you I, get a, go I, will, I would definitely say that I, I, I have a strong feeling that it's going to be a military person that to, to truly create to create separation amongst us. I will say that. It will, I, I, I believe that it would be a military person that's black. This is one of my prayers, <laughs> you know, that has the skill set, that has the knowledge, and they will. They are going, you know, at some point in the future. Maybe, maybe it'll be a time of weakness for for this group, but that that might will lead uh, many many groups of us train and develop and teach many groups of us at some point in time. Um, you know, okay. I don't think I don't think anyone 200 years ago thought that this thing called nuclear weapons would even exist. So I know that radical things can happen, radical changes can take place, um, and I know many of us hope that um, different things happen to them, physically speaking. But um, I think that as long as they're on this planet, you you better have a defense system. Absolutely, I do think that's a possibility paradox, but I think it has to be tied with a an ideology. 
and not, I'm not talking about the ideology of being black. Because oh yeah, it's gonna be beyond that. That doesn't sure. work. Yeah, for Absolutely. sure. Right. That doesn't I mean it just doesn't work. The ideology of of blackness, black power that that does not work. It's been tried many times and it's failed. Black power, uh, black nationhood. There has to be something completely to change the game. I'm sure there are people out there who have ideas in mind. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree. I definitely think that, um, the, the, like I always say, the great thing about it is that we are, people are trying. You know, people are trying to come up with solutions. I know in some cases these things kind of fall fall apart a little bit and then Unfortunately, um, our most vulnerable people get exploited. Uh, that's one of the unfortunate parts. So obviously, we've also been trained to buy and do other things based off this system. So, you know, we are trapped at this point. But I think that at some point in the future, and possibly even the near future, but I'm more, I'm more of a hundred year thinking type of person. I try to be anyway. But um, that at, at some point, because you know, you know, what's funny about you know, I don't know what the end of a warring tribe looks like. You know, do do does a group of people who are designed apparently to always want to kill, always want to take, always want to conquer, always want to control, always want to implement their ideology on uh, on other human beings and even even on the earth itself. You know, I wonder. You know, does that have a limit? Do they know that they have a limit? That that they have a time. And, and their time will pass and what are and clearly they're going to have some things in place you know possibly to 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 to, to deal with that uh i always would talk about the me and uh, dc sometimes talk about the thing is the final solution we, we would kind of i wouldn't use the word joke about but you know we kind of think about you know at transition points in, in in future times, you know what is the, what are the what are some of those things look like, and and where we, where will we be? And again, one reason for these type of for the, for these kind of calls for me personally, anyway, is to kind of think about you know these calls kind of drive me to think about you know when they make a mistake. I mean, a series of mistake. How does that impact black people? And I think people who are listening to this call and talking to your friends and family. Um, clearly, many of us are unfortunately will lose our lives because we're under white supremacy. We're under the white empire. We're in this thing called America. Uh, unfortunately, this place will be attacked. It will be conquered. It will collapse. And 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 hopefully we can we can figure out something before all those events take place. Because one of my one of my bigger fears, one of my fears is that. Um, we've established, even on this call alone, we've we've established that we are around people who are not just psychopaths, but very, very, very highly intelligent, highly skilled, uh, ruthless uh, murderers that have zero conscience, can create their own realities and live live in what they call peace and harmony. That's what they call it. Um, anyway, um, and can sit around Girl Scouts and all type of nonsense. You, you know what I'm saying? Just the, the mindset. To, to, to be able to mass murder and at the same time have this thing, you know, have camps and stuff. It's just, it's just uh, the more you think about it, the crazier it appears to be, obviously, in my opinion. But anyway, you know, I, my, 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 one of my bigger fears is that what do you do? With, what, what would they do with the Negro problem when, when, when they might be vulnerable for us to make a move or when they're just vulnerable? You know, they made some mistakes, the economy takes a hit um they get a few people in charge that maybe depletes the military maybe they break up with 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 europe you know they they may be just going through something in time and some other nations decide to collaborate or des decide to make some moves and there's a there's a massive fight and this may be more more you know sooner than later where do we fall you know will we be forced to go and kill for them again you know, will we be will we be put in in very vulnerable, very dangerous situation? Because again, we don't fight for them. I think that they either kill you, court martial you, lock you. I mean, they, I know they have all these rules that they that they do to you um, because because you're a part of this civilization. So I just wonder, and D, I let you jump in, but I was just wondering, do you, you know, what what is our you know us as a group? 
I know we worry about economics. I know we worry about trying to get food. I know we worry about uh, different types of violence happening to the men and to the women, to the boys and to the girls. And we're trying to figure out social things to get us through day to day, to get us access. I understand all that stuff. But at a larger level, what is our position if this if this place gets hit? Or if this, do we have any contingency plans? Are we thinking about those things? You know, are those some things that that even even because I'm gonna tell you something. A lot of a lot of smaller groups that are very aware, very conscious. That's what people are gonna go to. You know, so people out there who are, um, you know, what I'm, I'm gonna let D jump in because I know I only got a few minutes left before I start going on a tangent. Well, uh, I mean, I think but, you, I think you summed it up pretty good. I mean, <laughs> until until we can um, come to grips with the reality that, that we're currently living in and the way things are, um, we we just need to just be steadfast and continue to reveal truth and hopefully um, the, the cold and the psychological hold that white supremacy has held against um, people that uh, fall into the classification of black um, can start to weaken and then you know, there can be real, real, real segue into actually getting this, um, this situation resolved. Yeah, I'm not sure that, uh, I, I, even in that type of instance, not to say that I disagree, but I don't think that people will still be able to get past the race thing if something major or catastrophic were to happen. Because it's such, a, it's such a strong ideology, uh, and that's I think that's why one reason they're trying to eliminate Islam. Islam is a very strong yep. ideology. Yep. And it, uh, I think, according to them, it must be eradicated. Yep. Well, it's one of their it's one of their biggest fights that they, they got, that they got to deal with. One of their biggest ones might be the one. I mean, arguably, you could say that the crusades never ended. Yeah, That's yeah, cool. I think so. I, I agree. I agree for sure. It all of it's connected, and it never stops. You know, it's all connected for sure. Well, we we know that this system is basically the most efficient, the most um, powerful system that's been known to man, as far as as far as we know it. Um, you know, most of the most of the population on this planet um, talks talks um european european languages so um and they're only 10 percent of the um the globe less than 10 percent of the globe so you know how that makes sense so yeah definitely you you may be right the way that they have actually reframed people's realities and reframed people's minds by giving us definitions of race may be too hard to shake but i don't think it's impossible but yeah, i think i think i think war i would just say i think warfare will cleanse a lot of that I'm thinking. I'm thinking in those terms. I'm not really. I'm not overly concerned about the day to day interactions that we have and things that we got to do, like going to the bathroom. I mean, like at the highest levels, if if it's enough war and enough cleansing, I think that a lot of that will will check uh, some of these things. Some of these things. But anyway, go ahead, T. My bad. No, just right quick because nobody's coming up on it. But it, I mean, this may be another show. But is Islam? the only ideology that can challenge the ideology of race, white racism white supremacy at this, at this point yeah yeah I don't know. yeah you don't and, and that's why they're so focused on trying to try to eradicate it yeah cause cause you can you can you can you can bomb a country you can destroy a city but boy a, 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 a ideology that's a, that's a billion people uh, that's believing in it and it's growing every every day I definitely think uh, that it's, it's a big task for them you know, I know one one way they're trying to do it is by trying to moder trying to create moderates and trying to create other. They're trying to inf you know, trying to infuse different things into their societies to balance out uh, that belief system. Well, the problem is they have reason to resist, and the reason is very very um, prevalent that you know they are living in these countries that are being bombed relentlessly. They're being terrorized. So with that you know you just are already born on a side so the children are born into it and it just the ideology takes hold because they're being attacked yeah definitely definitely be a good show definitely be a good show but anyway we're coming to the end of the program uh, again thanks uh, Mr. Reed and Black Talk Radio this is the Code Breakers this is Paradox 
This is D. This is T. Until next time, peace. <laughs>